All right. What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares and set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys that was in Leavenworth with and others who survived their own nightmare. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that'll help you knock down some of the prisons you built up in your own mind. All right, Nightmare Success In and Out listeners, we are back, and I know you guys come here for the good stuff, the stuff about what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality, how do you adapt, how do you survive, how do you overcome? Well, I've got a guest today that did all of that, and he's, he's ripping it up now. It's Zach Babcock. He's, um, he's got an unbelievable podcast that just keeps growing. It's called Underdog Empowerment. It's a, po- it's a podcast for alpha underdogs, and uh, he's, he's, just, he's, he's really an inspiration because of what he's done and how he's done it. Uh, there was something that he said that he keeps somewhere in around in his room that says, I'm here to get everything you said I couldn't. I love that. <laughs> It's, it's just like, yes, I get it. And I want to say Zach was really helpful with me, with uh, Travis Ritchie, who was on here a couple of podcasts ago, helping me get into um, over 200 prisons. Um, there's, I think, over 750,000 tablets uh, that's uh, in across the country. So, Zach Babcock, welcome in, man. Brent, what is going on, man? I am excited to be here. Thank you for having me today, man. Well, I just I, I want to unwrap all this stuff because your story is fascinating. I mean, uh, and we'll just go back a little bit. You know, growing up as a kid, Zach, how, what was it like? I mean, I know your story. Can you tell the listeners just a little bit about what what it was growing up when you were a kid? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll keep it short. And then, um, you know, if you want to go deeper, we can always do that. Um, Growing up as a kid, um, grew up, uh, my dad died when I was seven. And um, I remember just like disassociating and like not crying. And like, you know, I didn't know what I was doing then, but I was literally disassociating from the experience or whatnot. And um, yeah, I didn't really uh, just deal with that the right way. And then that my life just started tail spinning after that, man. And I would like, I would always get told that I was uh, no good, that I wasn't going to mount anything because, you know, I couldn't focus in school and, you know, all this crazy shit. And I'm always uh, just, just told that I wasn't going to, going to mount anything, always being put down. Like I wasn't good enough or whatever. And I, you know, I, by the time I was nine, I, my mom had put me in a rehab. I got kicked out of there cause I was the youngest one there. And then I got put in a, she put me in a psych ward. And this was before like the courts got their hands on me. So like my whole like youth was like in and out of juvenile detention centers, rehab, psych wards, you name it all the way up till. till Jack, I can't even imagine that at nine years old being in that type of environment. I mean, wh- how did you, what were you thinking at, at that time as a kid being in that world? Well, um, I recently in 2021, I started, uh, uh, doing like a, whatever you want to call it, inner work, healing, whatever. I, uh, chose to do, uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy, uh, which has been it, right now it's got a, cl- uh, clinical trials, the 70% success rate in clinical trials or whatnot. It. Yeah. They're doing Some it with like, stuff. uh, like, uh, people have been in war and all kinds of different, uh, trauma. Yeah. Yeah, especially those people that have been in war or whatnot. It's dude, it's uh it's some really good stuff. But um so when I did that, man, it brings up memories that your ego literally suppresses. So like I forgot all about the stuff because like it was so so painful at the time that my ego like suppressed it so I and disassociated so I didn't have to feel and deal with it at the time and it's literally been stored in my body the whole time, which is crazy. It is uh, but it's I'll wild. I mean it's amazing what your mind can do good and bad, right? Yeah. So yeah, man. When you were so you get you were getting out of that, and then you were also. I mean, at that time, you're just a kid. I mean, you're, what is school like for you? You know, are you are, are your teachers telling you the same thing? You're not going to mount anything. This is this is not good for you. You're down the wrong road. We're going to just put you over here and and not deal with you. How did how were you dealing with all that? Yeah. So like. Uh, my mom, even though she put me in the rehab, she didn't, she, she was always there supportive. Like as far as like, Hey, I believe in you. You could do anything you put your mind to. Like she was the one, you know, giving me the, 
the encouragement that way. Um, but she still put me in the fucking in yeah. a psych ward when I was nine, which was not a, How long not a good you move. There? Five days, but man, it was one Probably second. I was five years, dude. I felt like I was gonna die twenty four seven. I'm nine years old. I'm seeing like these crazy psycho kids like in the corner laughing and shit. Staff members are screaming at you and abusing you, literally restraining and hitting you. And it's like a scary. And movie. then I'm getting woken up at dude. I get woken up at like two or three or four in the morning, whatever time it was, and I'd wake up being restrained and they'd have a fucking needle in my arm shooting all types of drugs in me and taking my blood and shit, dude, like mm. fucking really fucked up, you mm. know, but, uh, yeah. Um, school, <laughs> uh, with all that going on, like, you know, when, a lot of kids, they, they, they used to call it like ADD and it, they said I had ADD, ADHD, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all that <laughs> shit. Right. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, I don't have a problem focusing at all. Um, but I do, uh, I, I do, I, I, it's hard for me to focus on something that doesn't interest me that I'm not passionate about. Sure. Um, but I've been learning a lot, like a lot of the shit that I was doing in school and the reason why I couldn't focus because I had all this fucking trauma and shit sure. fucking going on. Right. You know, I get it. So when you, and if I remember your story correctly, you were rolling along and then you started getting into heavier drugs and I'm assuming that that was a way for you kind of to escape from all the stuff you were dealing with. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it was. So I started smoking weed at nine. That's the reason why my mom put me in the rehab. Um, I was smoking weed to numb myself, you know what I'm saying, from from the shit, right? To not feel it, to not have to deal with it, right? Um, and did that all the way up till 17. And then that's when I started graduating to other drugs. Eventually, dude, I started playing around with ecstasy and Coke. And before I know it, I'm overdosing on heroin and smoking crack. It's crazy. So how did you get, you know, I think your siblings, you had a sister, right? And she yeah. was younger, older. She was older, three and a half years, three and a half years older. So this starts happening, start getting into drugs and, how does this, how does the legal world come down on you? What happens on your, on your own nightmare with that? Yeah, man. So, uh, was in and, you know, in and out of juvenile detention, boys homes, whatever, all my adolescence and youth. And then by the time I was 17, uh, I had caught a case. We were out, uh, being idiots. We didn't even need to steal, but we were out stealing from people's cars and rich neighborhoods. And that led to people leaving like garage door openers in their car. And so we'd open that up, go hit some other houses, come back if the garage door was still open. Then we'd hit the garage and take their power tools or whatever, whatever they had that was valuable in there. And we didn't even need to steal the stuff. Like I wasn't rich, but I wasn't poor. You yeah. know what I mean? And, um, we were just doing it because we were bored mm -hmm. and, uh, long story short, caught a case. I took the rap for all of our, it was four of us. I took the rap for everybody. And then that got me into the adult prison system. And then, uh, you know, just tailspin after that was started, started the heavier drugs and just thought life was over and was given up on life. So when you got the first sentence, I think if I remember right, you were, was it seven years that they, they tagged you with? Yep. Seven yeah. year sentence. And I guess that was a state state case in Missouri. What's it like? What were you 19 years old? Yeah. What was it like walking into that world and, and that age? Whew. Man, uh, the, the, the more probably, probably more traumatic than what it needed to be. But, uh, I was, uh, you know, I was in, in county jail for, for eight months before I got sentenced and before I actually finally got left county jail to go to prison. And the whole time in there, I'm stressing the fuck out thinking like, Oh man, dude, like I'm not, soft or anything but i'm also you know not some big debo dude sure, either right and i'm like man they, i'm like dude are they gonna try and rape me whatever like you know i'm thinking about all this yeah. stuff man and it, it like losing sleep just panicking stressing out yeah yeah and no, there's nothing good about county jail i mean i for people who've been to jail there's a bit there's a difference between jail and prison and oh yeah you know so you walk in um, to prison, and what's, do you have any different strategies of how you're going to deal with that world? I mean, you walk in, fairly young kid. A lot of young kids are in prison, though. 
you have anybody that comes and helps you out? Do you have anybody, you get a prison job? What, like, how do you live in that world? Yeah, I remember um, there was a guy in county jail that I did a bunch of time and that I had gotten pretty cool with. Um, he was like in a group that I'd always hang out with, it's like four of us or whatever that we'd hang out whenever we came out ourselves. And I'd pick his brain and, and he told me, he's like, hey man, because uh, I was like, dude, what do I do when I get there? Like, how do you know? Yeah. I was fre- freaking out. He's like, look, get there, mind your own business, number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, stand on your shit. You don't got to go fighting or nothing, but don't let nobody punk you or nothing. And if you say something, do it. And then number three, stick with your own kind. Uh, unfortunately, in prison, as you know, you've been to prison. Uh, the racism is a lot like more. Uh, what would you say, more primitive, prevalent or yeah, whatever? It's primitive. It's, it's a primitive environment. Yeah. Yeah, like when you go to the chow hall, white people sit with white people, black people sit with black people, Mexican. Like that's mm-hmm. how it is in there. And then if you go and and if you are white and you go sit with the black or, or Mexicans or whatever, they're coming after you. You know what I'm saying? It's right. Just it is what it is. So told me those three uh, rules and I was like, okay, I could do that. I can stand on my own shit and I can, I can mind my own business and I, and I can stick my own kind. Got it. Got it. And so the yeah. advice. Yeah, that was it. On the outside, you get your mom, your, your sister and a girlfriend. I did have my girlfriend when I went back to prison, when I went, went in the first time for, for the long stretch and I didn't have a girlfriend. So did you get visits? Yeah, my mom. So, even though she did traumatize the fuck out of me by putting me in that rehab and shit and that and that and that, and that psych ward or whatnot, um, she, I, she was always there for me though. Like as far as like she would always come visit. Every day she'd always like tell me you could do anything you put your mind to, and she genuinely did love me even though she made some you know mistakes like we all do. Um, but yeah, she was there and supportive. Yeah, I think it's a big deal. I mean, I was lucky like that. My my wife at the time she. She came and I, you know, the one thing I think about visits is, is you, it's like you straddle the fence. You, you, you got the prison world and you got the outside world. And, and if you can have that connection, it, it keeps you from getting too institutionalized into the prison world. I think, I mean, you can still get, still get institutionalized cause you get into bad habits and uh, ugly, you know, you're in an ugly environment and there's things, but I, I think the other thing that you said that's interesting. And I also think it's something that plays into as you get out, you search for people that were getting it right too. So, you know, how do I, how do I make this work? How do I make this work for me? And that's what you got to do in business too. You know, you've got to, you got to look and say, okay, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. Who's getting it right. And then how can I implement that back into my world? Um, I know that you, there, there's a, a really gripping story that you talk about where you're in prison, you get put in the hole I can't remember why you got put in the hole, but um, you're in there and you get called out of there to the captain's office, which is never good. And can you kind of lead us through what happened with that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so this was 2010. I was two years into my stay there. Uh, like I said, I had a seven year sentence. I didn't at this time. I didn't know when I was coming home. I ended up coming home at, a little bit over after four years. So I'm two years into this four year stay at the time. Still don't know when I'm coming home. I'm 21 years old in the hole for tattoo violations. And um, like you said, I got called back to the captain's office. I'm thinking in my mind, somebody out in the yard had told on me for something that I, that I hadn't gotten in trouble for yet, or they were trying to get me to tell on somebody else. And so, you know, when I get back there, I'm all on this, like, what do y'all want? You know, like trying to play this tough guy stuff. And uh, he's like, you know, Mr. Babcock, you know, when you come back to yours, nothing good. And so anyways, I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. I ain't got nothing to say. Put me back in my cell. And he's like, yeah, we got a call from your, from your mom. And, uh, she found your sister dead on the floor with a needle in her arm. Mm. Um, my mom had to break into the bathroom with a screwdriver and found her, found her dead from a heroin overdose. Oh. Yeah, dude. And, uh, dude, I just started crying and, you know, uh, they, I asked to be put back in a cell by myself, uh, cause I had a cell at the time. And, Luckily, the hole wasn't filled up, and so they had extra space, and the guards were cool about that and let me go into the to a cell by myself. And the next three days was just all I could think about was all the mean shit I ever said to her and, and you know, how I wouldn't be able to say her goodbye and uh, how my mom was going to be at the funeral with her only, burying her only daughter and her only sons in prison, all this shit, right? And uh, just in a really, really dark place, man, and it was really, really tough. And I remember on that third day, though, I woke up and was like, God, 
I don't know why I'm here, but there is a reason because I'm still breathing. What can I do right now to find happiness and peace, man? And that question just led to this answer of keep your shit in order, dial it in. Like this, this I will, I'll spare you the details, but like, man, OC didn't have nothing on what I was doing <laughs> in the cell every single day. Same thing, same time, every single day, like, like clockwork, but it helped give me a peace of mind and keep some sanity in there. And, uh, yeah, man, I, I learned a great lesson by that, you know, about the quality questions that we ask ourselves, which is really important. Yeah. Cause your mind responds to it. You know, when you ask yourself questions, you know, it's, it's your, your mind then tries to find the solution. And, yep. you know, I think from where, where you were, I mean, you had a 30 second conversation with your mom, which if you think about that, that's, that's almost unbelievable to think that you were dealing with something that traumatic losing your sister and you had 30 seconds to share with your mom that information. And then you're led back into, uh, by yourself in the hole. And, and, you know, a lot of people, I think what's interesting about that. And I think it's, what's interesting about your story, Zach, is that a lot of people, you know, everybody falls down and everybody finds their rock bottom. Sometimes they find it a couple of times, but you could have gotten in a fetal position and just given up, but yeah. something, the way that your wire didn't do that, it did just the opposite. You, you had, you went to try to find a solution to make yourself feel better. And you started cleaning up the place, started doing things that, you know, that made you feel different. And once you got out of there, you still had what, two and a half years or two years left, right? Was your yeah, time? Like you said, Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I, at that time, I didn't know when, I I didn't have a parole date yet, so I didn't even know when I was coming home. But yeah, I ended up doing two more years. Did it feel different, your time from that point forward? Absolutely, man. So what's crazy is I, 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 sh I spared a lot of detail about this story because I didn't want to just go into a ramble mode. But man, before this, I um would do things that I didn't want to do to fit in with other people. Like... um. I wanted to be accepted. I mean, we all do. Everybody yeah, wants to be accepted. Sure. It's a human, it's this human nature. Uh, but I really wanted to be accepted really bad. And so I would do stupid shit that got me in a lot of trouble just to be accepted by the cool guys in prison or whatnot, or, or fit in with them or whatnot. And, um, I never really felt like, a, a, a like a, like a, like a, or like a real man that like I could say no to other people or something until this happened. And I went through this process and then I was down in the hole for two months. So I'm, I'm doing this crazy routine and I'm finding God and whatnot throughout this process. And, um, at the end of it, I found a peace of mind in one of the darkest times of my life, probably one of the most peaceful I've ever been in my life. And, and I was inside of a prison cell, which is crazy. Um, and when I got out the hole, finally, I was like a new person. I was, I was, I like was rebirthed through that experience, man. And, uh, I, I, at, from that point on, I no longer did shit to like, like I would say no, if I didn't want to do something like, like, Hey man, let's go do it. I'm like, nah, man, I'm cool. I'm not, I'm not doing that. You know? Um, it was like a moment where I, where I finally like stepped into my own, as you would yeah, say. Found yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So you do your time, you get out. Well, tell me about this. So you, everybody gets a little weirded out when they get, you know, a few months to the door. What were you thinking at that time? I was ready. I couldn't wait to get back home at the same time. Uh, it was like, it's going to be different because I'm used to being locked up now. And like, I had gotten to the point where I didn't even think about the outside. Once you're, once you, you know it, man, once you're locked up for so long, you quit thinking about the outside stuff and you just focus on your day to day in there. And that's how you do your time. And, that's where I was at. I was like almost institutionalized in a sense, somewhat mm -hmm. to a degree. Um, and yeah, so I was like, man, this is going to be a, it's going to be quite a, uh, of an adjustment coming out. Yeah. And I think it's the reason I brought that up is I think it's interesting how in a, in a really bad place, prison guys can get freaked out about getting out of prison because they've become so used to the ugly routine that freedom scares them or makes mm -hmm. them uncomfortable, makes them nervous. And I think that you see a lot of that on the outside too. You know, people get into these ugly routines and, you know, whether it's a, you know, health crisis, bad marriage, bad job, whatever those things are, P 
people get into those ruts and then, you know, an opportunity presents itself and they can't step into it because it's, it's too much of the unknown. It, you know, you see guys catch, uh, you know, they, they catch an extra charge while they're in prison. So they stay in prison, which is, it sounds, yeah. it doesn't sound rational. Cause you know, you no. say, well, how could, how the hell could that happen to you? How could, how could you stay in prison? It be, it's because whatever's going on out there seems overwhelming and what's inside the prison walls seems like something, you know, and it's that whole unknown known thing. And yeah. people say, you know, I don't get it, but on the outside, people do it all the time. They, they, they stay in a really bad situation and the only thing that's going to help them is stepping into the unknown. And, and that's always fearful. Even if it's a good thing, it scares people. Even if it's a good thing, people get scared walking into the unknown. So Zach, you step out. How do you, how do you step out? Who, who's there? Who's, who's your support team when you get out? Man, it's a funny story. Um, so I got out, uh, the, the, uh, February 28th, 2012, I was 23 years old, just did a little bit over four years in prison. Um, so when I went in, you know, I went in at 19, get out now and I'm 23. So that means I could go to the bar and shit like that. Right. Experience all that shit for the first time. Well, first right, day, my you, mom, were, you were 19, you weren't 21. So yeah, he, that would be a whole new world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, man. And, uh, what's funny is, uh, my, my mom came to pick me up and, uh, I was in Pacific prison, which, uh, is about 45 minutes from St. Louis where, where, where I lived. And, uh, my mom came to pick me up and she brought, uh, the same outfit, uh, that I had, you know, when I got locked up and at the, when I got locked up in 2008, we, we were wearing, you know, and I was like, you know, trying to be like a, a, a gangster back then. Right. And, uh, I heard, uh, well, we were, some of your background stuff, you wanted to be a rapper, I believe, but that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll save that for another save time. That man. For another but, day. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> my, my clothes, man, back in 2018, 2008 the what was in style was real baggy clothes yeah like i wore i had a, a she brought up my pants which was a size 44 waist i wear a size 32 so i could literally fit my whole body in one leg oh, good Lord. so i'm putting on the clothes you know and i'm like i look at my mom i'm like yo mom i'm not trying to freeload or anything but you think you could take me by somewhere to pick pick up a pair of pair of, uh, an outfit that fits me and she laughed and was like yeah and so we we leave the prison and we go to target and we get in Target, and I started freaking the fuck out, man, because it was so weird. Because like, you're in you're in society, and everybody's walking around. They got a smile on their face, and they're like talking and conversating yeah, to you. Sensory and overload. Yeah, and I'm used to just like everybody, you know, minding their own business. Nobody has a smile on their face, and <laughs> nobody's talking and shit. You right, know what I'm right. saying? And being friendly. So it 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 freaked me out. And then like, I'm, 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 I'm there and I give my mom the clothes and I'm like, can I go out in the car? I'm having, I'm freaking out. She's like, yeah, sure. And it's like, all right, I'm, I'm going. And like, I was going to leave and you know, they got the doors where you walk in the sliding doors where you walk in, you got the sliding doors where you walk out and then they got the sliding doors in the middle mm -hmm. for the cart that you put the, the, the shopping carts in. Well, there wasn't any shopping carts in there right at the time. So I thought it was just a normal door and I'm trying to go through the middle and the door went and open. And I'm started panicking. So I'm like, did, yeah. oh, <laughs> they locked it on me and they're getting ready to lock me up because they can't <laughs> some shit. I was stressed out, man. It was yeah, it was an adjustment, man. It was it was wild to get used to the to the free world again after being gone for so long. So you get into the world. What do you what's what what are your first steps of getting back into the to the free world? Man, at this time I was you know, I was 23 and I ended up going back to prison after this. Um, I stayed out for two years and I, and then I went back one more time. Um, which so I want to talk about I was, that. I want to talk about that too. I don't want to, I won't, don't want to go over or gloss over that. Cause that's a big part of your story, you know, with, um, you know, at the time that it all happened and, and, you know, you, cause the, you know, the interesting part of your story, I think Zach is, is that you kind of came to, found basically who you were back down to your soul. You get out, you start drinking. And then that, you know, I guess in a sense, you know, drinking can, can bring you down. I mean, it can, it can depress you too. What was all going on with you at that time? 
Yeah, man. I got out, was doing excellent, man. I was drinking, of course, still numbing, doing shit to numb, like uh, always was. Um, And still, even after I got sober, when I was doing business, I was being super ultra successful to numb and like, you know, the other shit, right? So, so, um, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm drinking though. I wasn't like alcoholic heavy. I was just like, you know, drinking, partying socially and stuff, working at a bar and stuff. Well, um, over time, about a year later, I got a, uh, a job at this clothing store that I used to always shop at. And, uh, I was excited, man. Cause, you know, ex convict, you can't really get right. hardly any jobs, man, let alone a good one. And I'm excited cause it's in sales. And I'm like, dude, that's my jam. Mm-hmm. And it's at a clothing store that I already shop at that I love shopping at. So I'm like, cool. You know? And so, man, I get to rock in there third day on the job. I sold 3000 on a six hour shift. The whole operation that day did 9,000 total. So in six hours, I was one third of the whole operation for the day. Um, and they gave me a promotion and boom, I'm now I'm in management. I'm excited. I'm like, I'm finally putting my past behind me. And then, and then, uh, human resources called me like, yeah, you're a convicted felon. You got to kick rocks. And so like, just like that, wow. I was like on top of the world thinking I'm advancing to yeah. all the sale, the wind knocked out of my sails. Yeah. Like, damn, this is never going to, I'm never going to overcome this. This is all. And so I was defeated in a, I had a defeated mindset and I gave in and threw in the towel and just started drinking hardcore. Like would wake up by like 10 in the morning from being so wasted the night before and drink all throughout the day, slamming beers until about 9 PM hits. And then we start switching to whiskey and all the way to whatever. And I'm just, yeah, I was just like, fuck it, man. It's over, man. And that ended up getting a DWI and let me go in the back to prison um, What's your girlfriend thinking at this time? I mean, are you having conversations with her about that or what? Like, are you just closed off? Like how's she dealing with you and your world? Because you were doing well. I mean, if I remember right, you had a job at a restaurant bar, you were doing well there. Then you got this sales job. You were doing well there. They kick you in the head saying that you're an ex convict can't work there. Where does she play into, to your mental world of how does she deal with that? Yeah, man. Um, you know, we, we also, she was pregnant too with twin boys and, um, man, there was just a lot of shit at that time. And I was in a really dark place and I was really like pushing her away. Like I was like burning everything down at that point. Just like, fuck it, burn it all down and pushing her away and just going out and drinking and just giving up, man. And she, you know, she was there, she was trying to, she trying was to being help. supportive and trying yeah. to get me on the right track. So you get picked up for DWI. You're, I guess you're on probation. That's, I'm sure you had like, parole. yeah, parole for a few years. And then you get the DWI. How do you find out you're going back? Um, so I got the DWI, they uh, made bond. And then, um, you know, a few weeks later was out drinking again, was at a bar wasted. Apparently I tried to pick a fight, uh, with a guy and, then the police got called and I woke up in Ferguson jail uh, with a massive headache and a uh, back hurt and sleeping on the metal bunk and, and learn uh, yeah, Stephanie couldn't come bail me out. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, they, they, they put a parole violation and you're going back to prison. And this is 20 days from my twin sons were born. And my heart like dropped when I heard that, mm. man, I was like, fuck man, the one thing, and I'm going to miss out on, on their birth, which was something that I always want, you know, I couldn't wait to be a dad, you know, cause I never had one growing up. Right. And so that, that for me, it right there in that jail. So that's when my life changed was that phone call. Cause that's when I said, fucking, I'm, I don't care what it takes. I'm moving in this direction from now on. Wow. How long do you go back? Yeah. So I didn't know how long they were going to keep me for. I knew that, you know, usually you go back for a little six month setback usually. Um, unless it's more severe, I had a year and a half left on parole. So I knew that's the longest they could keep me for. So it was anywhere from six months to a year and a half. I ended up doing eight months though. Mm. Okay. So now you get out this time, <laughs> you get out this time, you got twin boys. So you got a whole nother world at you now. You, you get twin boys, but you're coming out to a life that you've, you've hit your second rock bottom and said, Hey, this is it. Everything's changed. So what 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 happens when you hit, head out this time? Yeah, man. I uh, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I said I was gonna do so I, my my plan <laughs> that didn't ever happen. But my plan was uh, 
I knew I was going to have to change my people, places, and things yes. for sure because yep. I, I need to get different results. So I need to change all that up. That's a which big I was tip there. What you bit. just said, Zach. That's a big tip. Oh yeah, yeah. People, places, and things, man. That's that your environment, the people you surround yourself with, and the things you're doing. Get around the right people that are that already got and doing what you want, and get in the environment you want to be in, man, and, yeah. and do the things. That's uh, that's like you said, but uh, yeah, man. I, I knew I had to do that. But I didn't know what I was going to do to be successful. I was like, man, I'm so I was like, in my mind, I was like, dude, I already know it's going to be hard as hell to get a job. Well, this, uh, the Michael Brown situation happened in, in, uh, Ferguson, Ferguson while I was in, yeah, while I was in, while I was in prison, uh, this, that last time. And like I said, I'm from Ferguson. And so I was like, man, this is crazy news making this shit out way crazier than what it is. You know, this is how the news is. Uh, still a very unfortunate situation. I was like, I mean, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make these wristbands that say I heart Ferguson on them and these t-shirts that say I heart Ferguson on them. And I'm going to go door to door and sell them. Perfect. And a <laughs> hell of a business model, by the way. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> that was the goal. Um, and so I got out and uh, was looking for a job to fund that idea and couldn't find a job to fund that idea. And so that ended up never happening because I ended up getting involved in network marketing to kick things off, which is another crazy story. And how did, how did you, how did, how did you find that? How did that, where did that come in? Bro, I, a guy, com- I was in the gym every day and, uh, just making posts and, uh, a guy commented on one of my posts, like, Hey, I got this drink. You want to try it or whatever? And I was like, I will tell you, you can make some money off of it. And you end up only living 15 minutes away from me. So we met up and tried the drink out. It was like a little natural energy drink yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And so I was like, fuck it, let's go. And, uh, yeah, we made it happen, dude. I was making almost $2,000 a month residual income, uh, through network marketing, uh, for about two years there, uh, which is actually really fucking good. Oh in yeah, industry. absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And, and it wasn't like I was rich or nothing, but man, that was, a game changer for somebody coming out of prison that couldn't, you know, could barely get a job anywhere. And now I'm making more than most of my friends and able to feed my family. And so it was a game changer and it taught me a lot and I'm super grateful for it. But at the end of the day, it wasn't my thing. It was a stepping stone to get to my thing. So let's talk about that. Cause I mean, you know, I don't know if anybody, you know, the one thing I say about when you get out, you, you have, you, no matter what, you have a tattoo on your forehead that says, I'm an ex-felon. And, you know, yep. and people wonder, you know, why, why, why is it so hard? Well, you know, if you can't get a place to live or you can't get a job, it makes it really hard to get back into society. What I think is cool, though, Zach, is that you knew, you knew you'd already been kicked in the head. You, you, you'd already shown that you could sell. And they said, no, we don't want you. Only because you were an ex felon, but then you knew down deep, hey, I'm good at this, I can sell, and you reapplied it into a place that would take you, and you made it, and and you used that piece because I I, because I want to talk about what you're doing now. You use that piece that the as a stepping stone to get to what your passion was. So you're at that point, you're making good money, you're taking care of your family. What's going through your mind? I knew um, it wasn't my thing. It wasn't when I was, it, it just, I was building somebody else's dream and I was super grateful for the industry and always will be. Um, but that industry, it taught me like what was possible. It showed me a lot of things that what were possible. And I was like, man, I need to go do my own fucking thing. And um, also too, you know, I, my, my income had started dwindling a little bit. It was, I was still making like either anywhere from 750 to 1500 a month, um, you know, fluctuating or whatnot. Never did drop down below that, but I wasn't passionate about it anymore, man. And so I decided at the beginning of 2017 to jump off the cliff and grow wings on the way down. Like I always do and go do, go start my own thing. <laughs> I and, like that. Jump <laughs> off the cliff and grow wings on the way down. That's good. I like that. <laughs> It's got to figure it out, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I ended up uh, leaving that and uh, struggled mightily for the next year and a half with that too. But uh, yeah, that was the game plan. So where did you go? What was your next? What was were, were you reading? What, what, what was getting you to the point where I'm, I'm going to? As an entrepreneur, you 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 know you take bits and pieces and then you jump. So what what did you jump to? Man, I seen Gary Vaynerchuk 
at the time, and I was just watching his stuff, and I was like, man, I don't know what the fuck he actually does, but I want to do what he's one of the doing. biggest people. It's That guy's unreal. I mean, I don't know how many fo- – he might have the most followers on all social media, but the guy is unreal. Yeah, 1,000%. And I just – I'd see him, and I was like, dude, I truly don't know what he does to make money, but I want to do what he's doing and just create content because that's what I love doing. Yeah. And um, so I left, and I started doing that. And quickly learn like, oh shit, I need to make money doing this. How do I make money? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that started that whole process, man, of like trying to figure out how to craft an offer, a message and all this stuff. And uh, it, it wasn't pretty. And uh, there was, you know, people say this overnight success now, but they, you know, there was many nights where I'm up at three or four in the morning trying to figure out how to get a fucking funnel to work or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, learning all this shit. But, uh, Man, I was uh, definitely grateful for the process. So did you go, if I remember us talking, Zach, did you go to like a mastermind or something? I, if, if I remember right, you like, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I think I'm remembering this right. Like you just gathered up a bunch of money um, for this mastermind event because this guy had what you thought you needed and you went to it. And that was kind of your rocket fuel for you to take off. Is that, am I correct about that? Yeah, yeah, for the most part, um, so two two big events. That was the second one. First one was I launched the podcast in April of 2018. Before I launched the podcast, nobody was wanting to do anything with me. Like I'd reach out to people, and people would like open my messages and leave them on scene and not respond back a lot of times. And um, I just felt like you know nobody you know took me seriously, honestly. And I was using that as a chip on my shoulder. Um, and so. I launched the podcast, got it ranked on day three and had Billy Jean as marketing on the following week. So in one week's worth of time, I went from nobody giving me the time of day to interviewing very influential people that a lot of people already know and look up to that I'm trying to talk to. And so I was like, holy shit, man, this is wild. And so that was a lot of people give up. You know, that's, that's one of the crazy things about podcasting is, is I think 80% of the podcast drop off in the first, what is it? Three months, you know, they, they just, they quit because they just, they don't, they can't get the content, can't get the, whatever it is, but you found a way and then you got somebody really big on and I'm sure that created some momentum for you. Oh yeah, man. 1000% man. Um, and like you said, man, most people quit, you know, by episode 13, they're done. Um, so I broke through with that and I'm like, wow, this is, you know, it started like getting me brand awareness and building my brand and like opening up opportunities. More people wanting to do stuff with me. People are wanting to come on the podcast. Obviously people want me to come speak at their events. So I'm like, this is cool as shit, man. Uh, but I still wasn't making money yet. I hadn't figured that part out yet. I was making anywhere from like 200 to $800 a month through affiliate marketing that I was doing, but that was it. And that's not enough to feed a family. And so, um, you know, I, I, that was the first event, April, 2018, fast forward to, to, uh, eight months or so, or four, four or five months later, I seen that offer where Mitch put out an offer about helping you, you know, with, with crafting an offer first and foremost for a specific audience and then communicating that offer through copywriting to them or whatnot and positioning. And he wrote this, this bomb ass offer uh, for his mastermind. Uh, which is two thousand dollars a month, and I've seen it. And at the time, our bills were backed up, our <laughs> water was shut off. Yeah. Like literally, our water was shut off. Man, we got four kids and uh, credit cards maxed out. And I went and got a title loan on my Chrysler, a- Chrysler Aspen for four thousand dollars. Crazy dumb interest rates, like crazy high. Everybody's saying you're crazy, and I went and got in his mastermind at two thousand dollars a month just to try to learn that stuff. Yeah. And everybody said, like, dude, you're stupid, you're crazy, yada yada. Well, eight months later, we had a Six figure business because I because I went all in on that. Um, so I love yeah, that. I love that story because you went all in. You know that they, they, my grandpa used to say the difference between the ham and the eggs at breakfast. The chickens involved. That pig, he was damn committed. <laughs> but you you went all in. I mean, you got totally committed, and I'm sure everybody around you thought that was nuts. I mean, like you said, your water's cut off. Uh, but you had this drive, this passion, this burn that you had that said, I, I got something in me. I got to make this work. I know it's good to work. And you found a way 
to find your way there, not everybody would have done that. Not everybody would have gone to the mastermind. They would say, ah, it's too much. I can't do it. There's no way to get there. I can't, I can't, I can't. And you figured out I can. And then you end up going and you're, I mean, your thing's really blown up, Zach. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you just got off, um, interview with Brad Lee, who's, you know, big, I mean, I don't know if there's, there's probably five or six people that are just gigantic and he's one of them, but you're just tenacious, man. You just, you just keep, you just keep going. You don't take no. If they say no, they don't have enough information yet. And so you get back from that mastermind. Did it, how long was it from the time that you felt like you had the tools that things started working for you? Yeah, man. Um, went and got in that mastermind in September of 2018 and, uh, didn't break through, didn't make money until March of 2019. So I went and got that title loan in September, 2018. We're going all the way to March now. It got worse in between that time with money. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it got even more stressful, but the skills were being developed. The, fr- the, the labor was being put in and the fruits were getting ready to be harvested. How were it you just, guys uh, getting by? I mean, <laughs> how did you survive? Stephanie and then credit cards maxed out using her dad's credit card. Just you anything you can do. Like this, yeah, just, yeah, winging it, man, getting by, figuring it out. Winging, hustling and getting it. <laughs> it it's, no, yeah. it's, 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 it's cool because I, 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 um, how I found out about you, um, the trainer, uh, is it Bart? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I've got a, good friend of mine and i think he goes to the same gym he said man you gotta this i think they had the same train you guys had the same trainer and he said you gotta talk to this zach babcock man he's really just blowing and then i started checking out what you were doing i was like man because i'm a big believer when somebody's doing something really good go talk to him try to figure it out that's how you and i got connected was is is uh trying to figure out what in the world you were doing that were you know how'd you how were you making it work and you've helped me out you know the, the things you know, some of the things that I wasn't doing, it was like I had to just kind of slap my forehead and think, oh, hell, why wasn't I doing that? One of the things you said was just go on other people's podcasts and be guests because that's where they are. They're already on that platform. They're, they're podcast yep. listeners. They're not necessarily on Instagram and Facebook, even though you have an influence there. But if you get on other people's podcast as a guest, then they're going to see you as somebody and then oh well i'll go check out i'll go check out zach i'll go check out brent they've got a podcast i'll go listen to it simple but Mm -hmm. man it's it's a big deal because i mean i think you know you were telling me when you first started doing that you were doing you know a podcast or two a day as a guest and and uh you know you showed me the charts on that it wasn't easy but then all of a sudden that thing took off and then it became a multiple for you so unbelievable so yeah, man. Zach, what's 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 your next wh- where where you're at now? Because I know you've done really well. I mean, you've got yourself you've got a you know a house that that's out by a lake, and uh, we were joking. You know, your kids were out there. You're showing them how to breathe when it's forty degrees outside in the water. <laughs> I mean, all kinds of the stuff that you got to learn. But um, I've never done that, by the way. But I'm sure that, that that's incredible. Um, what are you thinking is your next step on this whole world thing? World dominance, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you know, um, for me, it's it's crazy. Uh, I, I was trying a little bit um, to go all in on this, this passion project, as you would say, or something that's more of like a purpose. Like, you know, obviously, I, you know, we, we launched the podcast business back in 2019 and We've launched to date 278 podcasts launched that got them ranked on Apple and we, and we got 281 in the queue. Um, it's a lot of podcasts, you know? Yeah. It helped a lot of people, you know, and, and podcast changed my life. It gave me a platform to get my message out there and to, to literally do everything that I'm doing today. And, uh, it's really cool helping other entrepreneurs do the same thing. Well, I wanted to do more, I, you know, that's how we are as mm-hmm. entrepreneurs anyways, but, I was like, man, I can help people so much more than just, you know, with podcasts. You know, I can help them with marketing in general, but I mean, I can help people just from a life perspective, man, and, and, and whatnot. And I, that's what I really, you know, want to do and what I'm called to do. But I was trying to go all in on that, on the passion project or the side hustle or whatnot. 
And I was trying to move away from the main thing. And the main thing is the podcast business. And until the side hustle or the passion project becomes the main thing, you got to keep the main thing, the main thing. Exactly. So, yeah, so what we're doing now is I, I'm all in. I'm always all in on something, right? <laughs> but uh, I'm all in on the, on the podcast business. So we're scaling that deal out. And uh, we're going to get it to, to a level where I can really, you know, maybe – give more time to the other things. I'm still doing the alpha dog pound and, and, and which is our mastermind and still doing that event that we do once a year, alpha dog pound live every, every July is when we like to do that. Um, but yeah, all in on the podcast and, uh, you know, yeah, I got, I got, I got tons of goals that I could go through, but that's the the big one right now is really scale the podcast power train up. Yeah. And I, you know, I was listening to, um, you were talking about on the beginning of the Brad Leah interview, you were talking about, you kind of hit a lull with, you know, I've done all this. I've kind of gotten to where I wanted to get to, but you know, you're, you didn't want to get away from being the passion and, and being a great dad and being there for doing. And I see all the stuff that you're doing, you're coaching and you're doing all those things. You know, you never, and I think, you know, uh, Brad said, well, that is your business. You know, your, your, your family is your business. And um, you know, I think, the great thing I think about what you're doing is, is that you're keeping things in priority and perspective, you know, making money uh, is one thing. Um, making a difference is another thing. Changing people's lives is the real thing. And, you know, for me, I, I look at what you're doing and, and I've had money and the, the, the thing about money is, is you don't worry about that anymore all the other stuff you still have. I think they say that in Forrest Gump, you know, you just, well, don't have to worry about that. But the biggest thing is, is that I think the thing that, that fills you up is changing and, and, and helping people and changing their lives. You know, that's whatever that fuel is, whatever that, and then you obviously have to figure out how to monetize so that you can make that happen. But uh, man, that feels good when it does happen. When you know that you're really touching and making a difference in what you're doing and that helps people's lives get better. And that's, that's powerful stuff. Amen. Amen, dude. I'd like to just expound on that real quick. Um, what you said about with the, uh, with the kids and stuff, man, like I'm all in dude. And like, uh, don't get me wrong. Like I, dude, I grind and I work hard, all these great things. Like I will go hard and, um, and I do, and, but now like, for first six years, I, I sacrificed like time with my, my health and my time with my family and stuff. Cause I thought that I had to do that in order to build the business. Now I'm at the part where I realize, like, wait a minute, dude, I can build this business whenever. Yeah. And right now my kids are never going to be this young again. They're not going to be in the house for forever. Exactly. This is the only fast. time I'm going to, yeah, this is the only time I'm going to get with them like this. So now I have a hard cut. 4 p.m. Central. I don't give a fuck what kind of fires are going on in the business. I don't care. I'm done for the day, switching to dad mode, and I'm with my kids. And now, like, I'll favor, like, like if, like, say, if, like, my kid's home from school, like he is today or whatever, I'm going to, instead of, like, do do work the whole day, like, when I got my creative time, I'm going to take him out to lunch instead. Exactly. I'd rather I'd rather spend my time with my son and take him out to lunch than then do like I'm still going to do the work. Absolutely. I, that, and I, I think that's, and you, and you won't miss, I mean, you do that now. There's no way to regret it later. I got one last question for you, Zach, because I know you got to jump. Um, going through everything you've gone through and you've gone through a journey here. What do you think's your biggest takeaway to tell the people out there? Man, focus on only the things that you can control and keep the small promises that you make to yourself daily. And that's how you win in life. If you like, look, man, we're all humans, dude. You're going to feel all the emotions. You're going to feel fear. You're going to feel scared and, and depressed and despair and all that. Like there's no way around it. You're also going to feel joy, bliss and happiness and all these things too. We're humans. We're going to feel it all. If you want to, and I believe, I'm a firm believer, there's no such thing as balance. All right. There, you just, there's no work life balance. Or, like even ballerinas, they look like they're balancing, but they're not balancing. They're just counterbalancing. Their toes are moving real fast. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like, there's no such thing as balance. Right. But I do believe that there is harmony. And I believe if you just focus on only the things that you can control and you keep those small promises that you make to yourself, that's how you get into that flow of life, that harmony. 
that's what I would leave everybody with. Love it. Send it there, Zach. I'll let you go. I know you got to get. Um, for everybody who's looking for a book out there, uh, you could get it. Nightmare Success. I wrote one it's called Nightmare Success. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, even Walmart. Um, the likes and all the social media comments. If anybody wants to leave me a message on BrentCassidy.com, I'd love that. Follow the show. Um, and uh, like I used to say when I was out, you know, writing my emails back from behind the prison walls, stay strong and I'll do the same. Nightmare success in and out. Thanks, everybody.